Dr. Chavis is going to be speaking about dialysis, thirst, and weight gains, what to do, fluid management. And let me give you a little bit about uh, Dr. Chadath is currently supporting the evolution of home therapies at Fresenius Kidney Care. He is a medical director at Fresenius Care Hemodialysis Unit in Louisville or Lawrenceville, Georgia, and a former chairman of FMC's Medical Advisory Board. Uh, he is president and CEO of Georgia Nephrology in Atlanta and lectures extensively on chronic kidney disease management. Uh, my question, welcome Dr. Chattis, but my question is why does Atlanta have so many streets called Beach Street? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out. I've been living in Atlanta for 22 years and I still don't know why. And it confuses everybody. I mean, it's so hard to get around unless you know which Peach Street, street you're going to. So that's a good <laughs> point, Lori. All right. Well, uh, take it over, Dr. Chattis. I'm excited you're here. Well, thank you so much. And again, um, it's a pleasure to be back again, the RSN me HOPE meeting, and, and pleasure to be here in front of everybody to talk about a very interesting topic, something that I'm, I think is key to how you do well on dialysis. Fluid management is critical in how dialysis care is provided. So I'll go over some of the basics and then talk a little bit about how best to manage weight fluid on dialysis. Um, I, I want to thank Laurie and, and the organizers for inviting me. Uh, it is, again, like I said, a pleasure. I'm going to try to see if I could share my screen. Um, you should be able to see. We can see it. You just need to put it in presenter mode. There, you got it. All right. So, yes, yeah, so as, as Laurie said, I'm going to talk about dialysis, thirst, and weight gain. And not just talk about the science, but what can you gain from it? What, what can you do about it? And there's a lot that you can do about it. And I'll touch on those as we speak about this topic. So before we get into fluid management, I think it's important to at least talk a little bit about the basics of dialysis. And, and again, for folks, a lot of you may know about this, but I just want to sort of revisit some of the fundamentals of dialysis. And the main purpose of dialysis in a patient with kidney failure is to remove waste products, remove the excess amount of fluids that builds up in the blood, especially in between dialysis treatments. And by doing all of this, to control blood pressure well. So dialysis allows the body to stay in balance, both chemically and from a fluid standpoint, by doing all of these things. But because hemodialysis, especially when done in a clinic, is not done every day, it's important to manage your care, not just during dialysis, but also in between dialysis sessions. And from a fluid standpoint, you have to restrict fluids as part of the dialysis diet. And I'll go into some of why that's important in just a few moments. But how much to restrict fluids is purely a matter of your overall health the amount of urine you make, and the type of dialysis. So if it's hemodialysis, the fluid restriction can be different than if somebody's on peritoneal dialysis where the treatments are done daily, the fluid is removed daily, and you could probably consume a little bit more fluid. So depending on the type of dialysis, the fluid intake uh, can vary. Now, if you look at the, uh, this little diagram in the bottom where, uh, where I've got these three little containers here, you'll notice that there's different principles of dialysis. And so diffusion is a process where toxins or waste products move from a higher concentration across a membrane to a lower concentration. And I'm not gonna get into a lot of science here, but just sort of point to, this is one of the ways dialysis works is we remove toxins from the blood by having a dialysis fluid that has less amount of that substance. So the, in general, the waste products move from the blood into the dialysis fluid. And that's one of the ways dialysis works. Another part of dialysis is osmosis. And this is actually where water moves from an area where of excess or from, a, from where there's delusion to an area to in a concentrated space across the membrane. And as you can see here, the arrow points towards movement of water from where there's less molecules to where there's more concentration on, towards the right. And so that 
indicates osmosis. And a third principle of dialysis is what we call ultrafiltration. And you'll hear this term in the dialysis clinic or when the nurses talk about it. Ultrafiltration in simple terms is applying pressure on one of the sides of that system where you increase pressure. And because of increased pressure, you now facilitate movement of water across the membrane. So in this case, you can see in that diagram, this pressure applied and, as a, and I'm going to try to see if I can use a pointer here. Uh, you can see this pressure applied here. And as a result, that water now moves across to the, from here to here. And that's ultrafiltration or fluid removal. So on hemodialysis, when we say we want to get two liters of fluid off, the machine applies pressure in a way to then facilitate fluid removal. And that's how we can set exactly how much fluid we need to remove with dialysis. Now, you may be wondering, why did I put up this little cup with the tea bag in there? Because dialysis, this diffusion, osmosis, and ultrafiltration is not something that happens only in dialysis. So if you can imagine a cup with water and you, you're putting in a tea bag in there, when you put the tea bag in there, the concentration of tea inside the bag is higher than in the water. And the first thing you see is there's going to be movement of tea from the bag into the water. You can see this dark colored area around the bag. That is diffusion. And now after a little while, the water from the tea, from the, from, the, from the cup will then go into the bag and mix with the bag. And that creates more movement of water in and out. And that's osmosis. So you can see how osmosis and diffusion, it's happening every day. It's just that we use some of these principles in dialysis with the intent of removing waste products and fluid. So forgive me for getting too scientific here, but I want to sort of at least present to you a little principles on how dialysis works. And then I want to just touch on types of dialysis, right? We have hemodialysis or blood dialysis, and then we have peritoneal dialysis where we use the body's internal membrane in order to remove waste products and toxins. Now in hemodialysis, as you can see here, blood through the needles goes through a pump onto this filter or dialyzer that you could probably see in the clinics. And this filter is where all the magic happens, right? This is where toxins and fluids are removed. And then the clean blood is then returned back to the patient, or to the person, right? So if I were to take a deeper look inside the filter, you're gonna see this little cartoon here where there's gonna be different concentrations of things inside the blood chamber and some in the dialysis fluid. So depending on concentration, that diffusion thing I talked about, remember the tea bags, the same concept happens here where in the blood there's high potassium. And you can see it's shown here in these little triangles in yellow, whereas there's less in the dialysis fluid. So eventually pot potassium from the blood will move into the dialysis fluid and then is removed from the body. Similarly, bicarbonate, which is in green here in this cartoon, will move into the blood because there's less bicarbonate in the blood, but more in the dialysis fluid. And that corrects the acid problem that builds up on dialysis. So there's an exchange both ways. And eventually as this process is completed, the blood is clean, the toxins are removed, and you reach equilibrium or a constant state. And that's what dialysis or hemodialysis is about. Now there is no filter in PD or peritoneal dialysis so the fluid solution bag drains into the abdomen and you can see this blue here indicates peritoneal fluid there. This little red area here is the membrane and that's where behind the membrane are red blood cells or blood vessels where we have toxins and those toxins then move from the blood vessels into the fluid. Again, similar to the tea bag concept except here it moves from the blood into that fluid and over time that toxin saturates that fluid and a few hours later, we got to drain that fluid out and then put some fresh fluid in. That's PD. So a lot of information, but I want to sort of just set the stage for a really interesting conversation. So in hemodialysis, and if it's done in a facility or a clinic, it's done three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Now that's what is typical in facility hemodialysis. So let's take a look at what happens when you limit fluids, it allows you to feel much better and healthier. And there's actually data saying that 
It, it improves so many things. And I'll touch on that in just a moment. And that's because when you don't have much urine output, you're dependent on dialysis to get rid of the excess amounts of fluid. Simple as that. So if you drink too much fluid, you're risking the chance that that fluid is going to build up between these dialysis sessions. So as you can see in this little picture here, this is Friday after dialysis, where my pointer is. And you can see that Saturday and Sunday, that fluid accumulates because there's no exit for the fluid. And before dialysis on Monday, there's an increase in fluid in the body. Now the dialysis session removes that fluid over four hours, let's say. And then there's a reaccumulation of fluid all the way through Wednesday and similarly through Friday. So there's this buildup of fluid that happens between sessions and the amount of buildup is directly related to how much fluids you gain in between treatments from fluid intake. So fluid restriction or maintaining that fluid balance goes very well with maintaining fluid restriction. We'll talk a little bit about how to do it in subsequent slides. So having sort of set the stage with some science, I'm gonna move into a very important part, which is how do you balance dialysis and all these fluids? So if you don't, if we can't manage fluid status well, and there's an increased gain in fluid between dialysis sessions, and we just can't get them out, we're risking that we're going to have swelling of our face and feet, difficulty breathing, headaches, low energy level, effects on the heart and blood pressure. So clearly, increased fluid intake is not good because it can cause all of what I just told you. So fluid restriction should typically limit the intake of fluids to around 32 ounces or less. As I pointed out, that depends on the type of dialysis. It also depends on how much urine a person makes. So clearly th there are, there's flexibility, but 32 ounces is about the average amount of fluid where we try to, and that is shown here in this cartoon where it says 32 ounces is about four cups, about a quart, and close to about a liter of fluid per day. And that's where you need to try to achieve. And there's a way, by looking at your weight, you can actually pace yourself to know how much gain there is over time. Now, we talked about the excess amounts of fluid. That's one way you can see swelling or, or increased fluid retention in dialysis. But I also wanna point out there are other reasons why people can retain fluid. So, <clears throat> inability of kidneys to remove fluid is definitely an important reason. Sodium retention is very common. So part of dialysis is, is fluid and sodium re uh, restriction. And then in some cases, a low albumin level, when the albumin in the blood goes down, that can lead to swelling. And there are sometimes medications, there are blood pressure medicines like minoxidil that can cause more fluid buildup in the tissues. And so that's something to watch out for. Steroids that's prescribed for certain conditions can also cause bloating and buildup of fluid. So again, just pointing out other reasons that can cause sw uh, swelling. And then underlying history of heart problems or liver disease can all cause swelling. So while I talk about dialysis and fluid retention, I also wanna give you a bigger picture of what else can cause swelling and edema. So I talked about how dialysis helps remove fluids. And that is extremely important because if we don't get all the fluid off, it's gonna cause fluid retention, which is a lot more than just swelling or bloating or just feeling uncomfortable. Over time, it puts extra strain on the heart. It makes the heart ha have to work harder and it makes the blood pressure go up. And if that continues to persist over time, we put the heart under a tremendous amount of what's called a volume stress. And, and I wanna show what volume stress looks like by this example here. If you take a balloon and you just normally inflate the balloon and then you deflate it, that balloon returns right back to its normal shape, no problem. But if you repeatedly overinflate that balloon over time, you make that balloon at risk of straining or thinning of its surface. And when that balloon deflates, it's gonna look like this here. It's gonna weaken the balloon as a whole. And that's what happens to the heart that over time gets to manage that stretch is that it makes the heart in long, over time actually weaker and therefore repeat cycles of stress on the heart again and again 
week in, week out can actually lead to heart weakness or heart problems. So clearly important to remove those excess, the excess amount of fluids to minimize the overstretching of the heart muscle, which is illustrated here uh, with the balloon example. <coughs> Excuse me. So what are the benefits of fluid restriction on dialysis? Well, clearly less fluid means easier to get the fluid off. So your blood pressure is gonna be better. You're gonna have more energy. I talk about the heart benefits, better sleep, less cramping during dialysis, less drops in blood pressure, overall stability of blood pressures, and overall better tolerance of dialysis. So we know that from the literature, people who watch fluid intake tend to have much better dialysis treatments and much better dialysis sessions. So fluid restriction is clinically shown to have significant benefits um, overall. Well, I'm sure you're thinking, well, that's all good, but it's very difficult to watch fluids. It's so difficult because, you know, four cups is not much. How do I do this? So I just put together a few tips that can help you with quenching thirst and limiting fluids. First and foremost, we tend to be creatures of habit. We like to drink from large cups or large containers. So the first thing I would do is try to drink out of smaller containers. Don't fill the glass to the brim and try to time it with meals preferably. So you're not drinking it between meals. Take, eat a piece of cold fruit like grapes or strawberries or blueberries. Those things actually allow you to get the benefit of something cold, getting the thirst out without truly having fluid gains. The other thing is freeze a beverage of your favorite beverage in a bottle, put it in a refrigerator, and then as the fluid melts, sip it. And that's gonna give you a chance to know how much to drink and spread it out over time. Suck on a piece of sugar-free candy. That can help get that thirst to go away or sugar-free gum. And then rinse your mouth with mouthwash because that, a lot of ways that can give you that freshness that takes away the thirst. And then last but not least, stay active. Work out a sweat because that can help you minimize the fluid gains and takes away that thirst over time. There are other strategies to out, for outwitting thirst that I want to point out. Something that I call fluid traps. Don't drink out of boredom or social habits. You're going to have to break those habits, what, we, what I call fluid traps. And so staying active or doing things takes away that desire to drink. If you get a craving for fluids, typically we say wait about 10 minutes. Call a friend or pick up a magazine or do something else or... I just said count 100, but you could count to 200. The idea is get engaged in other activities so that you take that, let that craving pass. And on hot days, keep yourself cool, stay in the shade, and try a mist bottle with a fan. That seems to work. In some cases, you could actually take a spray bottle, put it in the refrigerator, and just spray the inside of the mouth. You don't get a lot of fluid, but it cools out and quenches the thirst pretty quickly. In some cases, take a cool shower or a bath. And for diabetic patients, I just want to point out a critical thing is managing blood sugars. The better we manage blood sugars, the better we can control thirst. Higher sugars means increased risk of thirst. The other thing I want to point out is this fluid's everywhere. So you got to think about fluid, not from water, but it could be everything else. So soups, ice creams, nutritional drinks, jello, ice cubes, fluid filled, filled fruits like watermelon, cantaloupes sauces and gravy. So this is this, this fluid everywhere. So you got to keep an eye on a lot of things as opposed to just water or liquids only. So but generally what I tell my patients is anything that converts to room uh, to, to water at room temperature or liquid at room temperature qualifies as, a, as fluid and you need to restrict that. What about sodium? Well, I can tell you that the average American diet is extremely high in sodium. We consume about 3,500 milligrams of sodium on an average. We love salt in our diet, which is why we, there's a risk of high blood pressure and everything else that comes with this. What's recommended for a healthy adult is about 2,200 milligrams per day. We're already higher than what's recommended. CKD, we recommend less than 2,000 milligrams. So 
it's important to restrict some of that fluid intake. But more importantly, you know, we have to cut back significantly from what we're used to or accustomed to. And so sodium in the diet will lead to thirst, increase excess amounts of fluid intake, elevated blood pressures, and then the consequences on the heart and our system. So sodium restriction is what drives thirst. And so controlling both sodium and water is important. The other thing I want to point out is read the labels well, because the nutritional facts in these labels will give you a lot of information. For instance, you got to know your portion size. People look at the label, but forget the portion size, the serving size tells you how much you can have. Also talk to your dietitian about what this means, because they can explain to you a lot about how to, how to look at nutrition in these labels. More importantly, when you choose sodium here, make sure it's less than 10% of total daily value, because that's what we see is sodium is hidden sometimes and people don't recognize it's important that there's, a, there's relatively low sodium in the foods that you choose. On the other hand, avoid salt substitutes. Uh, one of the things we find is that people take salt substitutes instead of sodium. It basically switches sodium for potassium and that's not recommended because potassium uh, uh, can actually cause other problems. So clearly you don't want to, you want to avoid salt substitutes, but you want to take in more of herbs and spices, which add flavor. So an example would be things like Mrs. Dash. It's a great sort of, you have so many options now and you can use that and get different sorts of options there without truly getting salt. And, and like I said, look at sodium uh, uh, in the food labels, watch your convenience foods, fast foods, and canned foods, because those are sources of hidden sodium. <clears throat> I'm gonna jump to weights because in a way you can, you can pace yourself with fluids and by weighing yourself daily at home, you can tell how much you've gained. So if you gain a kilogram, you've got about a liter of fluid in your body. So it also gives you an idea of how to gauge your fluid restriction. And you wanna, if you can only drink a liter per day and your gain should be about one kilo per day, your average gains on dialysis between treatments should be two to two and a half kilos. So how do you do that? It helps you sort of at least monitor and plan fluid restriction. So before I go into weights, I thought it was important to talk about fluid compartments. So our fluid in our body doesn't sit in one big tank, right? Our body has compartments. We have cells and the fluid within the cells are called intracellular fluid. We need them. We can't do without fluid in our cells. And that constitutes about 66% of all the fluid we carry in our body. That's in this intracellular fluid inside the cells, as you can see here. And then we've got fluid that surrounds these cells in a space that we call, in, so if it's, if it's just in the space, we call it interstitial or in between. So it sits in the space here and that fluid baits the cells. So it kind of, kind of just baits the cells. That's important. And that's what we call extracellular fluid outside the cell. And then we've got fluid in our blood and fluid space, what we call plasma. And that's what we call intravascular or fluid within the blood vessels. And that's, so those are different compartments with dialysis, when we pull fluid off, we don't pull from all these compartments. We pull from only the blood. And so there's actually a, a balance. So if you pull too fast, if you don't give enough time, there's less time for equilibration between these compartments. And that's why people feel like they're cramping on dialysis or feel weak or tired. So part of what determines how people do on dialysis is how fast you pull because You've got to give time for the fluid to equilibrate between these compartments. So what kind of weights should you know about if you are on dialysis? Well, you should know about pre-dialysis weight. That's the weight when you first come into the dialysis clinic and get ready for dialysis. You should know about post-dialysis weight, which would be two different flavors. You might, I'm sure you heard about dry weight. Your nurses and physicians talk about dry weight. That's the weight that you want to achieve at the end of dialysis, which is without fluid and feeling well. Or you may have heard about target weight, which is for that dialysis session, what is my weight? They could mean the same, but in some cases they may mean different. So target weight's more per session, dry weight is what our goal is eventually without fluid. And then interdialytic weight is a weight between dialysis treatments. That's what determines how well you do on dialysis. Because if you gain too much fluid, you got to get that fluid off with dialysis, and that determines how dialysis treatments 
uh, tolerated. And then you have post-weight variance. This is the weight between what is deter desired, which is the dry weight, versus what is the weight that you actually left. So you want to minimize that post-weight variance. You want to get as close to what is ideal. And that's why the post-weight variance is an important concept for us to know. Are you getting as close to what was desired for you for your dry weight? And that's the post-weight variance. And then you must have heard about ideal body weight. The dietitians talk about what should be the body weight based on a body mass index. And, you know, for, and that's, so that's just the body weight we use for calculations. So how does fluid affect weight? Well, the more fluid you gain, the more your weights go up. So dry weight is the weight without fluid build up between dialysis sessions. It's the weight without fluid, hence the word dry. And it's the lowest weight that can be reached with dialysis or after dialysis without you feeling miserable. So people say, well, I, you got to cramp in order to get to your dry weight. That is wrong because that's with symptoms. The goal of dry weight is to get you as close but not having any symptoms of low blood pressure. So we want to make sure you minimize symptoms but get close. That's what dry weight is. And it's an elusive term because it's not easy to always get that. It's always difficult. There's always adjusting going on to get you as close as possible. But the goal is to remove as much fluid as possible during dialysis in a safe way to get you as close to the dry weight by the end of the treatment. So let me talk a little bit about fluid removal during dialysis. And that's what we call ultra filtration. And ultra, I talked about ultra filtration in my first slide. And that concept, I want to say, so removing fluid from, uh, from the patient during dialysis is ultrafiltration. So the rate is, so ultrafiltration is the amount of fluid being removed. So it's in liters or kilograms, depending on what you are comfortable with. And ultrafiltration rate is how fast we remove the fluid. If I have to remove three kilos and only have two hours, I got to crank it up to get the fluid off. But if I have four hours, I can slow it down to get the fluid off. And that determines, that's the rate at which the fluid is removed. And the dialysis treatment time is what also helps determine the ultrafiltration rate. So you want to slow it down to get the best effect. And we'll talk a little bit about how to do that. And the staff will set the dialysis ultrafiltration rate based on your fluid gain. So depending on how much fluids you gain, this is actually set for you. Here's a study that was done a few years ago that looked at really what happens with the ultrafiltration rate. So up to 10 milliliters per kilogram per hour. So for a 70 kilogram person, that's about 700 mLs per hour, which is about a little bit less than three kilos in a four hour dialysis session. That's as high as what the body likes. Any higher ultrafiltration rate, if you pull faster than that, it leads to very serious complications, including hospitalization and survival issues. So clearly the goal is to keep that ultrafiltration rate below 10 mLs per kilogram per hour, but definitely below 13. So our goals are below 13, ideally below 10. And people ask, well, how do I calculate this, right? So complicated. Am I gonna get this information from the clinic? And, the, and so the home dialysis central has a really nice ultrafiltration calculator well, you could go to this website, homedialysis.org, and you can actually put in how many liters you gain, what your weight is, how many hours of treatment you have, and you press calculate, and it tells you what your ultrafiltration rate is. And not only does it tell you, the dial actually tells you if you're in the green, which is less than 10, in the yellow, 10 to 13, and the red, which is greater than 13, which is where you don't want to be. So it gives you an idea of where you are, and it gives you your rate. So something that may be helpful for the tech savvy people on the call to really go on the website and get that information and find out what your ultrafiltration rate is. Intradialytic hypotension, hypo means low. So dropping blood pressure during dialysis. If your blood pressure is below 90 or you drop more than 20 millimeters of mercury during dialysis, that's what we call IDH or intradialytic hypotension. And it's not uncommon for blood pressure to drop during dialysis. We see that in about 15 to 45% of dialysis treatments. And how does that manifest? Stomach pain, cramping, yawning, nausea, vomiting, restlessness, dizziness, anxiety, or fainting. So it could come in different forms. And why the problem is when you pull too fast and remove too much fluid off, it puts the stress on the heart, on the brain. It causes that brain fog-like feeling. 
It can cause heart rhythm abnormalities, clotting of the, of the access, and other problems to the gut, and overall affects your quality of life and survival. So the goal is you want to minimize the risk of low blood pressures during dialysis. So critical that ultrafiltration rate to be low and avoid low blood pressure during dialysis sessions. So obviously your next question is gonna be, what can I do to adjust the ultrafiltration rate? Well, decreasing fluid intake, the fluid restriction part I talked to you about is critical. The other thing is do not shorten dialysis treatment times. We hear this again and again, I don't like to be on dialysis, so I wanna cut my treatment time to the lowest possible time I need. Well, I just wanna point out a really good study done a few years ago, that's the same study I showed you earlier, that says that if you are dialyzed less than four hours, 240 minutes, that puts a higher risk of complications. So when you look at four, more than four hours, for the three hours, three and a half to four hours, or greater than four, greater than four has the best outcome. So I, have, I told my patients, if you wanna dialyze in center three times a week, I recommend four hours, nothing less. And so that's why this four hour thing has been discussed because that's what it takes to get a good amount of fluid off but minimizing the risk. If that's not an option and you're at home, clearly more frequent dialysis, doing more frequent treatments with home hemodialysis using a next stage machine was, is a great option. Or doing dialysis at night, uh, either at home or in the clinic, what we call nocturnal hemodialysis. Or even better, do it every day if you're using PD. You can do a much better job pulling fluid off. Now, if you have to be in a clinic three times a week, there are other tools that we have. One is called a crit line that allows you to guide your therapy to minimize that risk of dropping blood pressure during treatments. Crit line, and then this is the machine that we're going to bring to the U.S. soon. It's called a body composition monitor that allows you to correctly assess how much fluid that needs to be removed. So I call this my navigation system on dialysis. The body composition monitor is setting the destination where I'm going, and the crit line is the map that takes me through the easiest, most efficient, and the safest route to get to my destination. So imagine the combination of this and this together. It's gonna to get you always to where you need to go without dropping out. So clearly a great way to combine two technologies to get the best effect. The other thing I wanna point out is avoid missed or shortened dialysis treatments. When you, when, when you shorten treatments, you put yourself at risk of hospitalization, ER visits, ICU admissions, and, hosp and also clearly mistreatments are more common in the US based on this study that was published a few years ago than anywhere else in the world. We've got to get away from the culture of skipping treatments or shortening treatment because by cutting a treatment out, we're risking the next consequence of that mistreatment on the next treatment. You've got more fluid built up, less time to get that fluid off, and the vicious cycle never stops. So clearly missed and shortened treatments is not a good option. And so I wanna talk a little bit about ultrafiltration on PD. PD is different because PD allows you to use that membrane I talked to you about earlier. And that is adjusted by adjusting the dextrose solution or sugar solution that we use. So there's, there's yellow, green, and red, 1.5%, 2.5%, and 4.25%. And based on the type of fluid you put in, it has different amounts of sugar or dextrose, and that allows the amount of fluid to be controlled. So there's the way you can control fluid removal in PD utilizing the dextrose solutions that are available. I talked about home hemodialysis or more frequent dialysis. There are studies out there that show that by doing that, it puts less strain on the heart. It allows for less risk of complications to the heart better blood pressure control, lower amounts of blood pressure medications by one third, much lower need for binders, the phosphate binders, better overall symptoms, rec less recovery time from a dialysis treatment, better sleep, and much better recovery from the treatment. So when I look at all of this, I'm thinking this is exactly what I want. I wanna feel well so I can do other things. And so clearly, there are benefits of getting those more frequent hemodialysis treatments uh, done at home. And I want to sort of summarize everything I talked about so far by saying that in kidney failure, fluid levels can be managed by doing dialysis and following a fluid-restricted kidney-friendly diet. So what can you do to manage fluid status? You could consider PD or home hemodialysis with more frequent treatments. 
you could have a, you should have an adequate dialysis prescription, which I, in my mind, the session length should be at least four hours. Adherence to treatment, avoid mistreatments or shortened treatments. Watch that fluid intake. Those tips I gave you are, that's gonna help you adjust the fluid intake. Sodium restriction, and then manage thirst. So these are all things that you can do to impact that ultrafiltration rate minimize the risk of blood pressure dropping during dialysis and take care of the volume problems that we talked about. And I wanna end with this slide, which is always talk to your dietitian, a great resource in your clinic. They're there to guide your nutritional health, manage your fluids for you. And they're registered by the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. So they're certified trained professionals out there to support you. So some of my patients tell me, well, they're the food police. They're not the food police. They're on your team. Utilize that resource well. And in the end, you know, they're here to support you and adjust things so you stay on course. So great resource that can be utilized well for you to understand how to manage fluids, thirst, and overall your fluid health. So thank you so much. And I'll turn it over to Lori for any questions. I appreciate the time. Thank you so much, Dr. Chadath. Um, I have to say, I am so thrilled. Let me just bring myself up here. Uh, I am so thrilled that you mentioned the crit line because I don't think we've been out to dinner together, but um, you can be certain that I will talk about the crit line for most of the, the <laughs> it's such a great advancement um, to uh, getting our target uh, weight right because I think you mentioned it, and there's a question here about, um, why is it not popping up? Oh, there it is. It's over in my corner. How do you determine target and ideal body weight? What's the difference between the two? Yeah, it's a great question, Laurie. So ideal body weight is, you know, it's not just a dialysis weight, right? It's for all of us. I'm a big guy, and my ideal body weight is much lower than what it should be, right? So to me, it's based on body surface area. What is that body surface area? And so without, so it's a goal weight or desired weight for every one of us. We use that in our calculations. Your dietitians use that to calculate various things um, and to assess your nutritional status. So that's where you hear about ideal body weight. So I'm gonna put that aside. Dry weight and target weight are dialysis specific weights that you should know about. So dry weight, is the weight I'd, I'd mentioned is the weight at the end of dialysis where you have no symptoms, feel well, and you've got almost all the fluid off. So it's the least amount of fluid in your body, but feeling well. We don't want to get you to a weight and then you cramp and feel miserable. That's not dry weight. Right. And, and the target weight, and the reason I bring up target weight is a separate concept, Lori, is because ideally target weight and dry weight should be one and the same thing. But the problem is, let's say on a weekend I gain two extra kilos, I won't be able to get those two extra kilos on Monday when I show up for my treatment. So my target weight for that day is going to be a little higher than my dry weight because I'm not going to get down to my dry weight. So we use two different terms, set the target for a treatment and dry weight as a goal for every treatment. And that's how I distinguish that's the two weights. Well, and I think it's so important because our, our dry weight, target weight, however we want to term it, changes over time. Um, if, you know, when I was in the hospital and I wasn't eating, uh, obviously my target weight's going to drop. But if you don't assess it correctly, then you're going to end up in fluid overload or vice versa. If you're feeling better and eating better, your target weight may need to be adjusted. And if they're trying to go for that fluid, you may end up um, cramping and crashing more. Um, there was a question here, and this, I'm going to get my blood boiling. Why does the crit line not work on everyone? Well, because it's user error. <laughs> uh, the tool is just a tool. I mean, I carried one in when I was on dialysis because I, I felt so strongly about um, safe fluid removal, and it allowed me to feel comfortable when they pulled fluid. Yeah, Lori, I agree with you. So it's, it's like the navigation system I talked about, right? I mean, you know, you can, set, if you, you can set your destination on the navigation system, but you need to know it's a tool, but exactly. the user determines how well it's used in the same way. This is the same situation. You're absolutely right. If it's used well by somebody who knows how to read and interpret it, 
and it uses a guide, it's a great resource to have. So it's something that we recommend. In your clinics, you should always ask how do, and, and there's a different, it's, it is complicated. It has to, you, somebody has to go through training, but it's something that can be taught and your team should be ready and trained to use the crit line appropriately in your facility. Well, and it's interesting because, um, and just full disclosure, I worked for the inventor for four years and I traveled the country with this product. And I saw how many times my life was uh, where they got the fluid wrong. My, and I paid the consequence. They, they thought the target weight, because it's kind of voodoo dialysis. I hate to say it, but they kind of like put all the numbers in and like, okay, that's it. You know, it's not an exact science. And, and, you know, what people don't understand is every time you're on dialysis, you present differently based on the sodium you eat. So if you decide to go out and have Chinese food or something like that with a lot of sodium in it, you're not going to give up fluid during your treatment. And the crit line is the tool that shows if you're refilling your intravascular. And, and, it, and I just, I mean, I bleed crit line. I can't believe that it's not everywhere. I just get like ballistic. Um, but it's so important because um, I can't tell you how many times people get scared about being challenged because when you crash, you feel like you're dying. I mean, wow. I did. Anyways, I feel like, oh my God, I'm out of control. It's the scariest feeling on the planet. But with the crit line, it shows the blood volume change in your intravascular, which causes the crashing. And if you go at a slow rate, and, and I don't know if this is scientific or not, but I'm going to let you decide. I went back on dialysis for a year before my fourth transplant. I had my third transplant for 20 years. I never went below 8% blood volume reduction intravascularly. That was my kind of me and my, I told my doctor, this is what I want to do. He's like, okay, Lori, I kept my transplant kidney function throughout that year because I didn't dry myself out. Excellent. And that is why PD helps people's kidney function stay longer. Because if you dry your intravascular out during dialysis, it dries the kidney out. And I just get so upset that when somebody says, and there was a study that people quote, and I'd love to go to dinner with doctors that quote this study, because they said, well, we put crit lines on the sickest patients in the dialysis unit, and we didn't respond to it, and more of them died. That was it. And I'm like, well, yeah, you picked the sickest patients in dialysis, put the crit line on it, didn't intervene based on the knowledge you were getting, of course. It's, yeah, it's lines only as good study. as yeah, crit lines only as good as the user uses exactly. it. It's a tool, it's like you said. And we're gonna have a long dinner, Dr. Chatta. Well, I, I, I'm looking I mean, forward to I it. I mean, it's and and then it also measures your oxygen. So you know, I mean, there were times when I had low oxygen and felt nauseous, and it was because of the O2, not because of fluid removal. Yeah, to me, Lori, that body composition monitor I sort of showed you a sneak peek of is gonna be yes. a really helpful tool to understand what that weight should be. So we know the guesstimate dry weight, target weight issue is gonna go away because we'll know exactly how the body is in which compartment. And so we'll know exactly how much fluid to pull. So it's a tool that is hopefully gonna be with us pretty soon. And I'm looking forward to actually having not just the navigation system with, you know, with the, how to, the map, but also the destination programmed in so we know exactly how much to pull. Well, and fluid management is the Bailey wick of dialysis because, uh, and this was some literature about 90% of all high blood pressure on dialysis and maybe it's changed is due to mismanaged fluid. Absolutely. And, uh, and I, I was on PD, I was on home, in center hemo back when I was a teenager and my blood pressure was out of control. I went on PD for one month. My pressure stayed 110 over 70 for the next nine years. And because PD managed my fluid. And that's why I'm sitting before you guys today. Because if I had high blood pressure those nine years, I probably wouldn't be here right now um, with all the vascular complications. So um, I will quit, but I get revved up about it. And I tell everybody to go learn about the crit line, go learn about blood volume management. 
And I'd like to, um, I don't see if there's any other questions. I don't know if I've ever shared this story with you, but back in the early 90s, I, with the crit line, I spent some time at a companion animal hemodialysis unit. Wow. In, 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 um, in oh, where was it? Sacramento, UC Davis. And they had the crit lines and the dogs did dialysis. I'm a big animal advocate and I would not put my dog on dialysis, but these dogs had nannies and they did really well on dialysis because they didn't have fluid gains because dogs aren't social drinkers and you can control their diet. That's so they didn't give them point. any sodium. They did really well on dialysis. I mean, um, it was really interesting and it was a, uh, 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 but I, I like to give that example because our body, we drink when we're thirsty based on our sodium content. So um, I had some lunches with Dr. Beldig Scribner, who was the grandfather of dialysis. And he would say it takes 21 days to lose the taste of salt. So if you can limit your sodium for 21 days, you won't feel like you're being deprived. And, and on a final note, I have some really sad news for you. I have been informed that Mrs. Dash is no longer Mrs. Dash. It's just Dash. And I am still trying to come to terms with that because I think I will always love Mrs. Dash. It is- Well, I'm just used friend. to the old style of what we called it. I'm sorry, names change. But I, <laughs> thanks for correcting me. I, I did not realize well, that. I I've been corrected, but I'm still gonna be always Mrs. Dash because it just makes me feel like my mom made it or something, not just <laughs> exactly. dash, sounds like I'm going for a run. Thank you, Dr. Chattis, for Thank your you. time. And we are going to take a break right now. And a shout out to our corporate mission partners for making this happen.